Hey, we're going to talk about fluvial systems, and I want you to take a moment to see the big picture before we begin our journey on the last four major topics of the semester, which are fluvial systems, groundwater and karst systems, then glacial environments and aeolian environments. All of these things are interconnected, and they all have significance to humans, how we live, how we survive, to the environment, to animals, plants, and the future of the planet and the living things on it. So I believe that this, these items deserve extra merit and care in discussing not just the geology definitions, but how it interconnects to other disciplines of science and into everyday life. That begins with the study of rivers and streams, which is the term fluvial. If you recall, lacustrine stands for lakes. Now rivers, many of them feed into lakes and then continue on as other rivers to the ocean. So we do care about lacustrine environments most definitely. But when we're talking fluvial, we're talking about flowing water. So the term hydrology, hydro refers to water. So this is the study of water. But it's not just water itself, it's how it moves, it's water quantity and water quality. If you recall early on when I introduced myself in the semester, told you that I had worked at Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, which is the state equivalent of the Environmental Protection Agency. They are deemed the regulatory agency that has oversight of water, air, and ground preservation. And so they certainly have oversight of water rules, including surface water. But I want to take a moment to talk about the Clean Water Act. So Congress passed the Clean Water Act and then the EPA was basically born. And when the EPA had to make rules about water, they basically said in the Clean Water Act, all waters of the United States include dot, dot, dot. And just about any kind of water you could think of that was on the ground <laughs> was included. We're talking things like Playa Lakes, which you'll learn about in Eolian. Things like rivers, lakes, streams, tributaries, even tides, so high tide, low tide areas. It didn't definitively exclude or include groundwater at the federal level. But at Texas, that's kind of a different story. We'll get to that in, when we get to groundwater. But I do want to tell you that water belongs to the United States. You're like, but I have it on my property. I can do whatever I want. Kind of depends. There are some exceptions. Some of the ponds that people build on their farms and ranches, stock ponds, those could be excluded from the definition, potentially. But when you have a river that runs through it, it really belongs to the United States. Now, here's the deal. The United States has turned around and given that water to the individual states. And from there, the states determine how they're going to allocate it. So things like the river authorities, the one I work for, the Brazos River Authority, they were in the business of selling water and still are through water rights because they've been given the water from the state of Texas. So what does that mean? <laughs> Essentially, that means you can't put in a pipe into, let's say, the North Bosque, the Brazos, wherever you might live, and decide you're just going to pump out water because that water's already been pre-purchased. It's already been allocated. And that's part of the story that we need to examine as we're learning about all the features of fluvial systems. I want you to be thinking about, hmm, how does that relate? Because we care about not just the water we're using today. As geologists, we also care about the landforms that are, are left behind from ancient rivers, the deposits, meaning rocks and minerals that are left behind. We care about all of those things. But as we're going through this, I want you to be thinking water quality, water quantity, and we'll get to that. So fluvial systems are the rivers and streams that we have. If you look at this picture and you're gonna see all the turns and movement of the rivers, rivers are actually diagrammed out by hydrologists. And you can see that kind of diagram right here. And it's 
a numbering system to talk about the headwaters versus the mouth, and you'll learn about that term in just a minute. But my point is this. Would you say that any pollution that's in these stream segments that are called ones or labeled as ones could feed into segment two, add to any pollution that may be there, and all the twos join up with the main stem of the river, which would be number three? And let's say that main stem fed, fed into the primary drinking resource for the city of Waco, which is Lake Waco. You getting how this all fits together? We care about fluvial systems and hydrology because humans use it. We use it for irrigation for our crops and for livestock and for big picture livestock, meaning concentrated animal feeding operations. We use it in manufacturing and commercial operations. We use it domestically as a water resource. So all of these things are part of the equation of water use, water quantity. You can also imagine the importance of all the water we have being clean enough to maybe swim in, fish. Maybe you are uh, someone that has livestock and you irrigate and you want it to be clean enough for your animals to consume. Well, EPA has levels of cleanliness that have to be met based on the designation of rivers. And so I wanted you to know that because not all river segments are equal. Certainly not all lakes are equal. You just have to know a little bit more about it. So another reason we care about river systems is that they are important for helping to recharge groundwater systems, which you'll learn about in the next lecture. So fluvial systems can be really tiny, really small, or they can be big and gigantic like the Colorado. But one thing is for sure, the big mighty Colorado, not as mighty as it used to be, I might add, and I'll explain why a little later. <laughs> It likely started off as what you see on the left, a small stream that over time grew with changes in the landscape, meaning uplift of the Colorado Plateau that tilted the land so water could begin to move, and snow melt each year from the snow packs would help drain in that would feed the water for something like the Colorado. But I need to point out that the rocks that you see in the stream in the left or what's responsible really for carving down something like the grandest of all canyons, the Grand Canyon. So while water does a lot of, of important weathering and even erosion, the movement of weathered sediments, what really breaks down the bedrock and rock layers like what happened in the Grand Canyon over here is that the power of water can move these uh, rocks and they can begin to really break apart by physical weathering in particular, substrates and bedrock. So it's the action of the rocks at the bottom of the river in conjunction with moving water that helps create canyons and such that you might see. So let's move into talking about watersheds. Watersheds are kind of an abstract concept, but I want to make it less so for you. Basically, a watershed is if you look at the left diagram I have right here, and I want you to look right along this segment here and right along this segment here. Can you see all the water when it rains with the clouds just draining into this middle section if it's from this high point and this high point? But let's say we're at this high point and it drains this way. The water at this high point will drain this way, and if it's on the other side, it's going to go into another watershed that's not even labeled here. Same is true over here. So basically a watershed is an area where water drains or snow melt, one of the two, into a common body, such as a river, lake, dam, estuary, ocean, wetlands, sea, whatever it might be. Watersheds in turn are uh, classified in river segments based by the EPA. And then river segments are designated based on how clean they need to be in terms of the human contact or human uses of that water, such as drinking water or recreation water for Lake Waco. So when you're looking at this, do you see, this is the North Bosque River watershed, not the Bosque watershed, but the North Bosque. The origins of the North Bosque would be way up here at the headwaters. And then it's gonna feed way down here where it feeds into Lake Waco, and that would be the mouth. Not all rivers drain into a lake, but many do. And lakes, for the most part, except for a handful, are 
the result of humans damming them. So in Texas, there's only one natural lake, which is Caddo Lake. The rest of them are dammed up. They're caused by systems of water that are periodically stopped by the process of humans damming them up to use water for water rights that I described earlier. So watersheds matter because as we worry about the quality and quantity of water, let's say in this watershed, wouldn't you also agree that all the little tributaries we looked at a minute ago, let's say if you're near Heiko and you got a polluted river stream right here. I'm not saying that's the case, but let's say that happened and it fed in, that could be concerning to all the downstream users. The same thing as if you have a pollution source in Clifton or down by Valley Mills. And the end users down here, which is the city of Waco and any other users of the Waco water, are getting the contamination that run upstream. Well, Water quality is only one consideration when we're talking about rivers and fluvial features. Water quantity is another, especially the further west you go in the United States. Well, let's keep going with that watershed divide concept because we learned about watersheds. And remember I said the highest point in each watershed drains into the lowest point? Well, that highest point is called a watershed divide. So. This, these two watershed divides right here represent this river. This black one over here and this one on the left is a different watershed. That would be watershed A, this is watershed B, watershed C. So the water is gonna drain from the high points in each of the watershed divides into the different watersheds. So most river systems are side by side by side by side, literally. And you when you start to look at rivers across the United States, you begin to see that there, there's just like one continuous landscape of how they intersect one to another. The largest watershed divide that we have in North America is called the Continental Divide. And the Continental Divide represents where water either drains from a high point going into the Pacific Ocean or towards the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic. And so there are many places that you can cross over the watershed divide or known as the continental divide in North America. So we're gonna define some basic river terms and I'm gonna help you learn what they are and then we'll get into why it matters towards the end. A river is a waterway that transmits water from high elevation to low elevation, period. It's surface water that's flowing. Now, rivers typically form from seasonal snow melt in areas that have it, or they flow continuously simply because there's enough supply from another river that feeds into it, but some don't. Some are intermittent. What that means is they don't flow all year round. But your larger rivers that are designated by EPA with a river segment typically flow year round. Not all, but most do. So let's get back to the terms that I was mentioning a minute ago with watersheds, headwaters versus the mouth. The headwaters are defined as the furthest upstream area of a river. Typically, it's going to be the highest elevation point that's not the watershed divide. So in the case of the North Bosque, that's going to be way up here. So you can imagine that this river's kind of like a trickle up there. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger with every small stream that feeds into these tributaries, which then in turn, they feed into the North Bosque, which is the big river that feeds into Lake Waco down here. So the headwaters are going to be the least impressive part of a river, but they're where they originate. So that could be important, especially if you're in a, an area that requires, let's say, snow melt for runoff that would help add water to rivers. That's certainly the case out west or in mountainous regions. And your headwaters, you're getting less snowpack because there's less snowfall because of a climate change condition. That could mean your headwaters location could potentially change or not be there at all. So let's talk about when a headwaters used to become way up at the top and it joins in and all the water starts flowing down and it hits this low section where it feeds into another place. Where water in a river feeds into another place is its flattest and usually widest section of the river and that's called the mouth. So the reason it 
kind of slows down the flow of water velocity is because the elevation or the dip is much lower. And as it hits that low degree, like maybe let's say just one degree of depth, it starts to slow down and spread out. That's often where you'll find delta deposits and so forth. And that's where it feeds into something. That something could be a lake whether it's man-made or natural, it could be a stream, another river, an estuary. In this case, it is actually the Pacific Ocean. This is a location along the Oregon coastline. I took a picture of a beautiful drive, by the way. But a good look at a river system that I have been driving next to for about a day, and I found where it exited and hit the uh, Pacific Ocean, and that would be considered its mouth. So what's a floodplain? This one is interestingly missed by people quite often, so I want to take some time to talk about the importance of floodplains. Floodplains are relatively flat land adjacent to a river. So let me first show you where the river is here. So this is your river right in here. Notice that it's all murky brown. It really is not normal that way. I'll say here's another floodplain back here. This is your floodplain. This is not the river, but where the water from the river jumped its banks and flooded over here. That's the floodplain. Why is that significant? A couple of reasons. <laughs> you can imagine if you built your house in the floodplain that you might have problems with flooding. And you're like, well, duh. <laughs> uh, well, that's why there is a program called the Floodplain Insurance Program through FEMA. And there are rules and regulations about how close to the floodplain you can build your house. Are you in the 10 year floodplain, 50 year, 100 year, 500 year, 1000 year floodplain? And then how tall or above elevation of that area do you need to build it? Now let's take apart the houses. A lot of times you're gonna see just what this land right here is being used for. Can you see the row cropping and that this likely is a pasture field of some sort and crop growing area? Well, there's a reason for that. <laughs> Not just because it's a floodplain and a house could flood there, but because it floods, there's going to be lots of nutrients that are washed down riverways from organic sources such as cattle droppings and urine and other sources of naturally occurring phosphorus and even industrial commercial uses, leaking septic tanks, things of those natures. And then just sediments in general, and they start to produce great fertile land on floodplains. So floodplains actually serve a purpose to us agriculturally. This term is not misspelled, ripple. Ripples represent the shallowest or shallower areas of a river that have lower than average depth with higher than average water velocity. So you're gonna look like tiny little waterfalls. And what's cool about ripples are that from a perspective of an environmentalist, we can look at the macroinvertebrates. You're like, what the heck are macroinvertebrates? Well, they are bugs. <laughs> and we can look and determine the health of a stream based on the population of macroinvertebrates, bugs that live in and on sticks and stones underneath them in ripples. And I used to do that when I worked for the Brasses River Authority. It's kind of a cool thing, but ripples are an important part of a stream, not just biologically, but also for the movement of sediment. Because in ripples, that lower stream depth doesn't allow for big size sediments to move, even though the velocity is fairly high. So you're not going to be forming big giant conglomerates and ripples. You might form them in the next place of a river. So these are just parts of a river that we're looking at. So moving on from the floodplain and ripples, let's get on to runs. What are river runs? These are the part of the river that exhibit a higher than average depth and a higher than average velocity of stream movement. So where I have the run pointed to, this is part of the river that's a long going to the sun road. So it's the last um, one of the earlier pictures I showed you. And you look at this, the water is just like roaring. And 
this would kind of be like your rapids or class, uh, different class rapids for rafting. Well, I guarantee you, you wouldn't be able to stand up in this water. You could in a ripple, but you certainly wouldn't have run because the power of water is extreme. It's amazing what it can do. So runs are important because they actually serve as a place where sediments are washed downstream, even bigger ones, especially during high flood conditions, high flow conditions. They also serve a role for the biology. Uh, for different fish, like different types of environments, some prefer... Uh, run some prefer pools, which is the next part of a river that we'll look at. But as we're looking at ripples, this is in Zion National Park up near the Narrows. So if you ever get to go to Zion, you need to go to this place right here. It's really awesome. I will tell you though, the water is super cold. So be prepared for that. But do you see these little ripple areas here? And then you see that their water is moving pretty briskly here, but it's much deeper. This would be the ripple, that would be the run. So remember, a ripple is very shallow. You're going to see the movement cascading over rocks, and a run is faster and deeper than average depth, where a ripple is faster than average speed, but lower than average depth. Well, that brings us to pools. Pools are areas of a river that are deeper than average, but much slower in velocity. Why does that matter? The rock type that you'll form there is going to be different than you would form in ripples and certainly in runs. So in runs, especially during flooding conditions, you could form very coarse sandstones and definitely conglomerates. But in a pool, the water velocity is so low that it may be almost imperceptible that the water is moving. In some cases, when a stream is intermittent, meaning it's not flowing year-round, it's just stagnant, it will not be flowing. So any suspended sediments will start to settle out and they're very fine grained, which means you're gonna make things like siltstones and shales and pools. Well, this matters, especially for ancient river deposits that we find in nature, because it can help us interpret how the ancient uh, river behaved. Was it one that flowed year round? Was the climate such that it didn't flow regularly or was it one that consistently flowed? We can tell a lot by the deposits left in the ground as what was going on geologically when that river once existed. All right, that moves us into different types of rivers. The first one is a meandering stream. Meandering means it winds and it turns. You can see that in this stream in Northern California near Lassen Volcanic Field. So I had just left that uh, national park slash monument area and really cool place by the way all the volcano types are found there and I'm driving by and I was like that is a cute little meandering stream and I got out and wanted to talk about how meanders form in cut banks and point bars which we'll get to in just a minute but meandering streams typically have one main stem of the stream not multiple braids of a stream and they just make a sinuous, like an S pattern. The more windy it is, the longer it's taken to form the bends, like the curves that you'll see in the stream. The straighter a stream is, either more recently it's been straightened out by a flood event, because water always is trying to find the path of least resistance, or it's a new stream altogether. So when you see very windy, meandering streams, that's a clue. It's a clue that you've had that river there for quite some time. So I'll let you in on the big secret. <laughs> streams move over time. And we care about that because not just geologically, but economically, we can find some of the stuff that's left behind by streams as it deposits sediments and use them for construction materials and road building materials, things of that nature. So as we continue our discussion about meandering streams, it's important that we talk about the reasons humans should care and do care about cut banks and point bars that are associated with meandering streams. So let's just hypothetically say that you own property around this section here. You bought a really nice ranch or a home you might want to consider not building a structure near a cut bank. 
I'm not saying that in your lifetime that it would eat away that your house, but it could if it was close enough to the shoreline because meandering streams migrate over time. But one area of importance is this thing right here called a point bar. Humans look for point bars because they're excellent sand and gravel resources. That's big business. I had a student a long time ago who uh, their family owned a sand and gravel operation in Central Texas. And the reason that such big business in Central Texas, sand and gravel is associated with the movement of the Brazos River over time it's migrated laterally. And so this group uh, of people, this family, are looking for ancestral point bars that they can either lease land to uh, extract those resources or buy land because it's a multi-million, actually billion dollar business. So when we're thinking about cut banks, this represents the highest velocity area of a stream. So it cuts faster, it, it, it's weathering and eroding this section, causing the bank to continually cut across. So if you look at the diagram, this would be your cut bank. The lighter sediments over here would be your point bar. Now you can see over time, the more that this meander becomes exaggerated, there's a potential that the stream or river would find the path of least resistance and skip having to travel around this section here, and this will cut off this meander, and it forms a feature we'll learn about in a minute called an oxbow lake. So again, the cut bank is right here across the way where the water velocity is at its slowest. The velocity of the stream can no longer carry sediments of bigger sizes, so it creates what's called a point bar. And these are found in tandem in nature. So when you're looking at this point bar, you can begin to see, oh yeah, well, I see another one back here. Yeah, you're going to, you're gonna see cut banks and point bars opposite each other. And you gotta think about why, because the point bar is the lowest velocity area, so it can't carry the same suspended sediments and gravels. You might know a point bar also as a place that you could find arrowheads or maybe even fossils. So I'm gonna take just a minute to remind you about the Archaeological uh, Resources Preservation Act, ARPA, that you learned about earlier in the semester, and also PERPA, the Paleontological Resource Preservation Act. So let's talk about ARPA first, because lots of people go looking at point bars for arrowheads and tips and spearheads and pieces of pottery. While all of that's worthy, I want to encourage you to make sure that you know you're not on public land when you are looking for these things, because you'll need a permit to even pick it up and move it. So let's say you find a piece of broken pottery on public lands, like Bureau of Land Management property. It's a crime if you pick that up and move it from its original location, even a shard of pottery. Now, if you're on private land and it's yours, you can do with that as you see fit. Same is true with fossils. So private land, that's yours. Even vertebrate fossils that are regulated under PERPA. But any uh, point bar that may contain vertebrate fossils or even invertebrate fossils on public lands, you need to be careful about that. You need to make sure that you have the necessary permits to take those items, any kind of vertebrate bones on uh, federal public lands, even state trust lands, is not yours to take. So if it's not your private property and you're collecting on it, you certainly need, in any case, to get permission. So can you see the point bars and the cut banks? The point bars have a distinctive look to them, right? You can see the gravels, and right across the way, you'll see the cut banks where the erosion is, is happening. So over time, these meandering streams become more sinuous, meaning curvy. And the straighter a stream is, typically the younger that segment is of that, that stream or river, the more curvy it is, the older it is. Easy to see the point banks and cut. 
easy to see the point bars and cut banks, right? You can totally see the deposits here. This is an aerial view, and I wanted to point out why this is so important because you could see a sand and gravel operation looking for these kinds of things because it's money. It, it is big business in terms of construction material. By the same token, I would say if you built a house right here, even this piece of property here, over time, this whole system is going to continue to migrate laterally. And there's a road back here. At some point, that could reach the road. So thinking about where you buy property, where you put structures, is important. This is the Brazos River, and I want to show you what's important about this. So this is a, a map that I obtained. Uh, you can go through a series of current and looking at the current status of the river and then overlay it with geographic information system. You can see that these are all old point uh, bars. And if you were to continue to look in either direction, like there's some way back here, then you can begin to see, yep, we got an issue where this river has migrated over time. So sand and gravel operations are all over this region because the Brazos has changed its location and continues, I might add, to migrate over time. But that is exactly why people care about them, because it uh, provides resources, it changes the land use, things of that nature. This is a shot of a braided stream, which is actually an outwash plain that you'll learn about in the glacial section that we have coming up. And this is in the South Island of New Zealand. I'm in an airplane looking down, and this is near Queenston. Uh, area. So I'm not too far from Milford Sound that you'll learn about. And there's valley glaciers that are melting in the region and uh, releasing water that are feeding this river. And if you can see the multiple streams that have interconnected here, that's called a braided stream. So we have these in the United States, especially in regions that were once glaciated, currently glaciated, you can even see a hint of what looks like braided streams at the Red River boundary between North Texas and Southern Oklahoma. Definitely not related to glaciation, but related to how the river system flows and the substrate in which it flows through. Braided streams tend to be a lot wider and not as uh, prone to flash flooding as you would see in a meandering stream. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. Of course it does. But just a single uh, stem meandering stream can flood very, very quickly. And that's because there's really nowhere for it to go out of its boundaries but up and onto the floodplain. And braided streams, usually the stream bed's fairly wide and there's a little bit more room to hold that. This is another shot of that same area in uh, New Zealand, and I want you to look at all of the rivers that are intertwining. That is a braided stream. All right, we talked about what happens when a cut bank gets cut off, and I want to show you the evolution of what we call an oxbow lake. Here is a just regular meander, right? So here's your cut bank right here and your point bar across from it. Notice over time that gets more accentuated because that's what happens as the cut bank continues to cut. You get more of a exaggerated uh, meander or sinuous turn in that meander. And look at this third stage in the diagram where you can see the water found the path of least resistance. So in that second stage, you can see it, it might do that, but in this stage it has. However, it is still producing water along that stretch of the meander. Eventually, that will stop and it will fill up with sediment and this section will make kind of a horseshoe appearance and it will no longer receive water. That is called an oxbow lake. So if you look at this right here, this is an oxbow in the make. Can you see how the river could find a path of least resistance from here to here, or even from here to here? 
in like a next flood event that happens. And if so, this meander will get cut off and actually no longer receive water at some point. So a story from my childhood, my best friend in high school, all throughout those years, her dad purchased a piece of riverfront property on an oxbow lake. And it was a couple of hours north of Houston where I grew up. And we would go there and it was so much fun. We got to ski, we got to you know, hang out on the river. It was just a blast. And at that time, I didn't even know what an oxbow was. And I was thinking, this is the best property ever. I wanna find one just like it when I grow up. Now, 30 plus years later, this piece of property is worthless because the property values plummeted because it is this situation right here. Not only has it uh, been cut off, the oxbow from the main stem of the river, this stuff has filled, begun to fill up with sediment so it's just like marshland. So the riverfront property value of her dad's place is just, it's tanked. It's no longer what it was. So I'm going to encourage you, there are places even around Central Texas near Belton, Temple, even not far from Waco, where there's some beautiful Oxbow Lake in the make, or even current Oxbow Lakes. Realize that the fate of every Oxbow Lake is to fill up with sediment. One reason I really love Oxbow Lakes is because the dinosaur digs that I have done, which are legally permitted and authorized, one of them in particular dealt with an Oxbow Lake. At least that's the hypothesis and theory of those who are the experts doing the digging. So I went to one of these in Montana and we found Triceratops fossils and the way that these fossils were laid out as well as the other dinosaur fossils we found and uh, I might add reptile and fish and other types of fossils, uh, mammal fossils, were all in a pattern that would suggest an oxbow lake. So just look at this situation right here and imagine if we scroll back time about 67, 68 million years ago and we put dinosaurs here they would have lots of vegetation to eat, water resources. This would have been prime time real estate for dinosaurs. So I suspect that dinosaur fossils, some of these animals died for whatever reason, uh, and they got buried along Oxbow Lakes because that's where they hung out. So just an FYI, something a cool sidebar about Oxbow Lakes. Can you see the Oxbow here? This is clearly one right here. This place right here, it's a very exaggerated meander. I could see the river taking the path of least resistance from here to here in the next flood event. Same thing from here to here. So a look at oxbows and understanding their importance for what we see. Rivers in general, even oxbows too, they're gonna fill up with sediment because that's what they do. They're transporting sediment. And you also have to think about where rivers flow. They either flow to the ocean or to a lake. <laughs> and so if it's a lake, that's potentially going to get filled up with sediment over time, depending on the amount of sediment transportation, weathering and erosion that happens through that river system. Here's another oxbow. Can you find it right here? Here's one that's already filled up. It's another section of it of sediment. This is the only part that's still got some water. This is all the same system. Over time, this could become another oxbow as well. So looking at Horseshoe Bend in Page, Arizona, there's a story about this place. Not only is it gorgeous, there's a lot of history in the United States about it and some important information about water resources. First of all, notice how red the sandstone is. This is called the Navajo Formation. It's also the same rock formation that makes up a majority of Zion National Park. You'll get to see a lot of Zion in Eolian when we get to that section. And I want you to notice how straight up these walls are of the Oxbow Canyon here. So back in the days when John Wesley Powell was surveying this area and actually describing and mapping it for the first time, these explorers described this place as the Colorado being mighty. It warred, it was 
very impressive, you know, very high class rapids. And you're looking at it and going, that's not what it looks like today. <laughs> and that's the case because there's two man-made structures called dams that have been built on the Colorado. One is by Las Vegas, which is Hoover Dam. Then that pools up a very famous lake called uh, Lake Mead. I might add that's the primary source of electricity and there's water there that uh, provides water resources for the city of Las Vegas and so forth and lots of other major cities too. Then they built a dam in the northeast quadrant of Arizona where this place is, Horseshoe Bend, and that is why the city of Page exists because the city became a place because this is super remote. If you ever get out here, like you have to be going here. <laughs> Page is not on the way to most things. And so when you're driving out this way, since there was really no cities or amenities, they had to make a temporary city to build the dam. And that's how Page became a thing. So in doing so, they, they meaning the developers who decided to put these dams in and the conservationists who only wanted two dams on the Colorado, made a deal that in order to get those two dams that they would put the Glen Canyon Dam where they placed it. Unfortunately, it turned out they hadn't gone there to see it in person. And before it got flooded, they saw how beautiful the canyon area was that ended up being flooded. So if you wanna learn more about that, there's a lot of history about this area. So now it's a thriving place and it is on reservation land around that surrounding area that belongs to Navajo Nations. And there's a really cool place called Antelope Canyon. You'll learn more about that when we get to Eolian as well. All right, there's another fluvial feature that's worthy to talk about, and that's a delta. Deltas form when the river, its mouth spreads out because the flow velocity dramatically decreases. The reason is the dip meaning the angle of the beds, the rock bedrock is very low. So usually about one or two degrees max in terms of how steep it is. And so it slows down, the flow of water drops out all the sediments and you get what you see here, which is a lot of sedimentation. You're like, well, that looks like a braided stream. Yes, and this is very common in a delta because delta deposits, they slow down the water much like a braided stream would. So, the deposits of deltas have economic value, much like point bars do, and they are extracted, especially ancient deltaic deposits, for the same reasons that we care about point bars. Here's a delta that's feeding into the Pacific Ocean, and this is the mouth of a river that I had followed right on near Forks, uh, Washington State. And this was a really cool place. And I was like, wow, there's a delta. And sure enough, it was the mouth of a river that was feeding into the Pacific Ocean. We've already talked about graded beds, but I wanted to remind you that rivers show a pattern of when they get high flow, like a flood condition, and then they abruptly stop. We see a deposition of big sediments, medium sediments, small sediments, and then tiny sediments settling out less, last. So the big stuff falls out first because it weighs so much more and the progressive grade of size getting from large to small, it graduates down from big to small because of that velocity change. So as a geologist, we can investigate whenever we see graded beds, we can say, hey, that was an episode that tells a story. It's just a clue about the ancient geologic conditions that existed when that graded bed occurred or got deposited. I might also say the size of sediments tells you a lot about the event as well. So if you got giant boulders, then you would know you had a big, like huge flash flood event. If you got smaller sediments, you know that it was a different type of a flooding event, smaller. So we're going to learn about cross bedding again, and you'll learn about it another time, I promise, one more time <laughs> this semester in Eolian. But cross bedding, you learned about in sedimentary rocks. We also talked about it in depositional environments. It's a super important thing in geology because it's a sedimentary structure. 
And one of the reasons we care is the angle at which the, the beds of sand that make cross beds actually get deposited has a lot to do with if it's in a wind or water environment. So the angle of repose for dry sand is somewhere between 32 to 34-ish degrees, and that's dry sand. And when you're looking at a riverbed, you've got water there. So you get really low angle dip types of cross beds. And that's very important when you're looking at rocks to determine, do I have a high angle type of cross bed that would tell me it formed in a desert? Or would you see something that is a low angle of cross bedding that would indicate some kind of river cross bedding situation? So that brings me into river or fluvial issues and sedimentation should be top of the list. Rivers move eroded sediments. That's what they do, they're erosion machines. <laughs> they weather as well. So the fate of every river is ultimately over time to fill up with sediment and a new one forms. And that is important for us as humans because we rely on water, especially since we've dammed up so many rivers to make reservoirs that we can hold water. Since we talked about water rights kind of early on in this lecture, water rights are surface water that's sold uh, throughout the United States. So we care about that. And the only way to prevent over sedimentation is to use best management practices. We're never gonna stop it, but we can kind of slow it down. Over time, rivers feed into either the oceans, estuaries, or lakes. So we'll use an example in Central Texas of Lake Waco. I'm not saying the lake is filled up with sediment yet, but I'm saying it could in the future. And that's something that planners look at and scientists model to determine how fast will that happen. Because it actually, having too much sediment reduces the amount of water a reservoir can hold. The only way to remove it is to dredge that, right? And that does happen, it's very expensive to do. In addition to reducing the depth of a lake, which is problematic for water rights and being able to fulfill those, there's a secondary problem that deals with ecosystems because aquatic animals and plants require a certain depth and the lakes behave differently when it starts to fill up with sediment. So as a lake ages, we refer to that as eutrophication. So in a very elderly part of a lake, then it's said to be in the state of eutrophication where it's filling up and it's no longer biologically uh, active the way it should be. Remember, we're using rivers and lakes for drinking water as well as other water resources such as irrigation. So this factor is a big thing to consider. Contamination is all about the cleanliness of water. So non-point source pollution deals with those types of sources of pollution that wash off during a rain event. Look at the water here. This is an Oak Creek Canyon near Sedona. It should not be red, it should be crystal clear. The red is the color of the sediments and the rocks in that area. So this was during a monsoon season and uh, literally the very beginning of July of the year I took this, which is right in tune with, with monsoon season out west, and it created a monster set of flooding. In doing so, it washed off sediment. You may go, oh, that's no big deal. Sediment's not that dangerous. Let me encourage you to look at it with a new perspective. Sediments have things attached to them, or they can. So they can have heavy metals, they can have oils, Worse, they can have microscopic pathogens attached to them, things like E. coli, Giardia, things that can make people really, really sick. So we do care about non-point source pollution now. Federally, we regulate construction sites for non-point source pollution and industrial sites, but we cannot permit like cars that park on a parking lot at a supermarket, even though they may have drippy oil or leaking uh, some type of a antifreeze dripping on the ground or somebody accidentally drops a dirty diaper on the ground. 
all that stuff gets washed off. These are reality checks. And that stuff goes into rivers, which feeds into lakes. And lakes are the primary drinking water sources for about half of Americans. <laughs> Looking at what may seem an obvious fluvial issue, it's one that people often overlook and don't want to think could happen to them. So in my own family, my husband's folks have a place along the North Bosque River and their house is a really good distance away from the river. But in the big flood of 1991, which is the December, January timeframe over a few weeks, just an enormous amount of rain came down in central Texas and flooded out historically areas that should not have flooded out. And their house was a case in point. Now they do have riverfront property, but the house is not on it. They lost most everything. And I guarantee you the people in these pictures, I didn't put the human people in here, but I need to tell the story because this very year I was traveling through the West and we drove through Zion and literally 12 or 14 hours earlier, a really large flash flood came through. It basically inundated the town of Springdale with just a giant mud flow. And it happened so quickly, monsoon season in the West and Southwest is late June, sometimes a little earlier all the way through early August. And of course, this was over the 4th of July weekend. And this place, the day after, they had already done hours and hours and hours of cleanup. This is in the west entrance of Zion. I was actually on the bridge that you have to get into and show your park pass or pay to get in on the west side. And this is where you take the shuttle to go into cool places to hike, like Angel's Landing or Observation Point or to the Narrows. This water is usually crystal clear, the Virgin River. The reason it's red is because that's the color of the rocks and the sediment. And like I said, it just completely flooded. This is a pretty famous place that's on the main strip of Springdale, and it's an RV campsite and motel. And what I want to point out was this was the the line of the mud, and this is on the side of the building, the front of the building, it came up a good three or four feet higher. And this is the swimming pool. And it was basically full of mud. And it was eye opening to see such a thing. About two weeks later, we were traveling back and we drove through Rio Dosa, and the same thing happened there. This had a bridge that went across it right here, and there are all these real nice high dollar homes like you see this one here. And what had happened was the bridge got washed out from flash flooding, the same type of thing. This lasted several weeks of pretty much daily heavy rains. And you can even see the mud line on the trees, it's up here. Well, somehow all the storm debris backed up and ended up in all of these homes and destroyed them. My point is, is that if you live along a river or a creek, you should expect that it will flood at some point. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. It's like living on the coast and you saying you're never going to get hit by a hurricane. Floods are real. And if you are in an area that is remotely in a floodplain, even if it's a 500 or a 1,000 year floodplain, consider getting... FEMA insurance for floodplain uh, stuff. They have a floodplain insurance. If you live anywhere near a river, you should consider floodplain insurance through FEMA. And they offer this program and it's worthy to have it because most insurance writers do not cover flooding, just as an FYI. So we had driven on our way to see Rio Dosa past this area several months earlier, and it was connected. This segment of the geologic formation had been washed out the day before we got there, maybe even hours before we got there. And it was just a big mud slop, I know, because we got out to take pictures, videos, and it, it was just really amazing to see how much damage happened so quickly out west because of these high floods. 
brings me to another issue. You're like, flooding, how does that have to do with droughts? <laughs> Believe it or not, this entire area has been in a mega drought for the last two decades plus. You're like, but all that rain caused flooding. Yes, every year there's some rain and it happens for a short, brief period of time. Here's the issue. These storms are going to continue to get worse. And one reason they're not working as well is the climate is changing. The atmospheric temperature is changing. You'll learn more about that when we get to glaciers. But this long drought correlates to surface water issues throughout the West and Southwest. You may not live there. Even if you're not in Central Texas, you may live in a different part of the U.S. or you may be stationed overseas. You could even be living in a different country. Water quantity is a problem everywhere and it's worthy to talk about. So this is the drought map for the United States and it's current. And what I wanna point out is the darker, the red and orange, the more severe and long-term the drought. So you can even see in Texas that there's problems with droughts, but you start to move into the Southwest and West, you should see a pattern. We just will be talking in your next section or chapter about this whole area right here, which is the Ogallala Aquifer, and that is not getting the recharge it needs because of these situations as well. This is Lake Mead, which is one of two lakes that have been dammed up on the Colorado River. And I'm very careful to say on the main stem of the Colorado River. So the white line you see in the background that's called the bathtub ring of Lake Mead. There's a matching one in Lake Powell in Arizona. What's interesting is this very year just like in the past few weeks as I'm recording this video the lake has reached the lowest level since they initially filled the lake which it takes years to actually fill up a lake the size of this it is at such a low catastrophic level. I need to emphasize how this affects you. <laughs> if you like wine, Napa Valley receives water from the Colorado for irrigation. They have water rights. This all matters. Let's say you like pistachios. Well, in the Southwest, that's where most of them are grown. They receive water from the Colorado. If you go to Las Vegas, they receive water from the Colorado. Matter of fact, power as well, because this actually produces a hydroelectric power dam known as Hoover Dam. So this is the dam that's out by Las Vegas. And Hoover Dam, believe it or not, is just slightly smaller than the one that's in Arizona called Glen Canyon Dam. So we'll be looking at that in just a minute. But to tell the story, I have to talk about the Colorado River Compact. So in 1922, the law of the river was established, and you need to know there's a little history. So basically, after the gold rush, California became a highly populated area, and it was booming in population. Sound familiar, right? It's still booming in population. And other states were beginning to get concerned that there wouldn't be enough water for them because California would start to dam it up and take it. So to make this agreement, stakeholders from all the interested parties, except for one, came to the table to try to come up with an agreeable plan of how the water would be distributed throughout the Colorado River region. That one stakeholder I'll get to shortly, okay? Having said that, it was determined that there would be an upper and a lower basin. In each state within these basins, so there's a group of states for the upper basin, a separate group for the lower basin. Collectively, it was determined that each basin would get 7.5 million acre feet. So that means 7.5 million acre feet for the upper basin and 7.5 million acre feet for the lower basin. So you may be going, well, what does that look like? What is an acre foot? If you take one acre of land and fill it with a foot of water, that is an acre foot. Water is sold as water rights by the acre foot. So you may not purchase a whole acre foot, you may purchase a portion of it, but that's how it's sold, all in acre feet. 
So that's 15 million acre feet when you add the upper and lower basin together. Here's where it gets a little sticky. <laughs> When the modeling on the data that was available back in the 20s to do this, it was based on not a mean, meaning an average of a collective amount of years. It was really based on one of the wettest years. That was problem one. So you get this allocation of water that really can't ever be duplicated again because it's based on wet years, not dry years, drought years. Issue number two, population changes over time. The way the states look today is not at all how the population looked back then. The most comparable would be California in terms of ranking first in the population race out west. So I mentioned that there's been a several decade plus mega drought and it's still going on. <laughs> This is the first time ever this year that there's been a mandatory rationing of water for the Colorado River Compact. Let me show you why that's so significant. The upper basin includes Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and New Mexico. The basin includes three states, Nevada, Arizona, and California. But let me talk a handful of moments about Nevada in Arizona in Utah. When they were initially allocated money, which is in the form of water, <laughs> the water is worth money, it's my point, it's the price of water, Nevada got the smallest sliver for the lower basin. So each state gets a certain amount based on their population. Nevada was the came in third, Arizona second, California first in the lower basin. Utah and Wyoming got the smallest sliver at the upper basin. And you can imagine that of all of them, Nevada got the smallest because it had the lowest uh, population of anyone. When you look at the population trends today, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah are growing by leaps and bounds. There's a town called St. George, a city in Utah that's one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. Las Vegas and Nevada, another step or a case in point, Arizona, you look at Phoenix, you look at Tucson, you look at Flagstaff, all these places rely on the Colorado River. Now, I need to add in another factor. Remember, each of these basins gets 7.5 million acre feet. So that's two basins times 7.5 million acre feet times two is 15 million acre feet. Well, there's three more million acre feet added to the equation. Half of that is to Mexico based on a treaty between the United States and Mexico, guaranteeing Mexico that amount of water every year, period. And the other amount goes to the tribal nations. And if you know about the, the lay of the land out there in West and Southwest, that's a majority of where our Native Americans uh, have their places that they lived for thousands of years, I might add. So they have some of the oldest water rights of the Colorado River. They were not given a seat at the table when stakeholders were determining what to do about the law of the river. That's an entire environmental injustice. Nevertheless, there is an irony about that because some of these tribal nations are actually trying to give back some of their water to preserve the thing that makes their existence possible. And they're actually trying to help out all their neighbors who are destitute for water right now because of the mega drop that's happening and the population growth. So again, let me link this to you. Citrus fruits, a variety of nuts like pistachios, wine in Napa Valley, all of these places that you may like to go visit, even lakes like Lake Powell and Lake Mead, which are used for boating and recreation and hydropower, they are at risk. And you need to know this bathtub ring, for example, right here, you see that it should really make you like, oh, this is really difficult to see. So going back to Lake Mead, Lake Mead and Lake Powell have something in common. They share the Colorado River. They both have a bathtub ring. 
And the human overuse of this water resource, because we have a growing population that needs to have water for irrigation, for agricultural use, we need to have it for drinking water, for recreation. We also need it for manufacturing. All of this is taking a toll on the biome and biodiversity that makes this place just really remarkable. As I mentioned, this is the first year since the law was ever passed, meaning the rule of the river, that there has been a mandatory rationing of water rights. That would be like you ordering a flat screen TV, the biggest, bestest, the newest type, right? And they sent you half of it in the mail. These people are not getting what they are entitled to. This is a really challenging thing. And if there's something that you leave with from this lesson, it's the price of water is going up. And that's worldwide, not just in the United States. So this is Lake Powell. You see that same bathtub ring. And I can even think about somewhere like India, which is the second most populous place in the world, country, and they receive a majority of their surface water from snow melt of the Himalayas. So imagine if the second most populous place in the world is literally fighting over how to get water, that this is a worldwide problem. This is not unique to just the United States. But the issue of the Colorado River Compact is one that may need to be addressed sooner than later, certainly in your lifetime. And you now know about the environmental justice issue with not bringing the tribal nations to the table to have their voice in the rulemaking process. There's so much more that I could talk about this and go down that direction, but I wanted you to know this is a thing. It's real, and it's something that you need to know. And you're like, well, what can I do about it? There's nothing that I can do individually to solve the problem. Well, of course you can't solve the problem, but you can be part of the solution. The first thing I would consider is, can you conserve water in any area of your life? When you brush your teeth and you wash your hands, does the water just run in the sink? There are civilizations in the United States without naming them, that still have to walk and carry water up to the tops of mesas. They don't have flowing and running water or sewage, I might add. And you're like, oh, that's not possible. Well, there is. So they care about every drop of water. And every drop does cost money. Could you consider maybe turning off the water when you're washing your hands and brushing your teeth and turning it back on when you need to rinse them off? Maybe you could take shorter showers by adding a low flow shower head. And maybe the length of your shower doesn't change, but the volume of water that you're using would with that, by that simple retrofit. Could you only wash full loads of laundry so you are not wasting water? Could you plant native vegetation for your area? For example, in Central Texas, a lot of our yards have St. Augustine grass, beautiful grass indeed, but it's not native requires a lot of watering, doesn't do well in droughts. But if you were to, pl to plant native grasses like Bermuda grass, it's beautiful. It requires virtually no watering. Nature does its own work, and it re doesn't require much mowing. So it's like a win, win, win. And before you start taking water out of rivers, lakes, and streams, make sure you know what the local, state, and federal regulatory requirements are and that you're not taking somebody else's water right away. So all I can do is encourage you to conserve. And if one of us will do that, teach somebody else to do it, start practicing one thing at your home with your family, then the next family does it. And before you know it, neighborhoods are doing it, cities are doing it, statewide efforts are doing it. It becomes a national and hopefully a global paradigm shift of wanting to conserve one of the most precious resources on earth, which is fresh water. This is an oxbow lake, and it's actually two oxbows, but it is called Oxbow Lake at Grand Teton National Park. And I want to encourage you just to take a look at this and just see that it's just overflowing with live 
things like you see waterfowl there in this picture you're not going to see it but there's actually an otter or two there's beavers earlier that day there we'd seen what looked to be a moose which is my favorite animal <laughs> there could be bears foxes you name it there's and there's all kinds of aquatic plants the point is this ecosystem depends on fresh water and you're like well but that's in Wyoming and I'm where I live that's true, but you have an ecosystem biome and you are part of it that relies on water as well. What we do to conserve it matters. And I would ask that you consider to do your fair share. If you have questions or concerns, feel free to email me. Otherwise, I'll see you at the next lecture. Bye.